Hi there, I'm Joshua Moore, and for my self-directed learning experience, I'm going to cover sex and the brain. Uh, I work with a lot of neuroimaging in a lot of different ways, like neurofeedback and QEEGs and CES, or cranial electrostimulation stimulation therapy, things like that. Uh, so it's commonplace for me to talk about the brain and the different structures of the brain, which I'm gonna do for you today with a prop to try to make it a little bit easier. <clears throat> uh, but we're gonna move very fast, just because we don't have a lot of time and there's a lot going on in the brain. So I'm going to skip some of these slides. You're welcome to go back and read them. Uh, I'm going to put them on the, the I'm going to post them for you. <clears throat> uh, and But we're not going to go over all these data points because we can't. First of all, I just want to cover the brain is very dynamic. It doesn't go into stage work, but we're going to do that for functional purposes. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm going to go through uh, maybe the overview. I'm going to explain each section in detail. And if you want to, you can go back and look at the slides uh, in more greater detail if you'd like to. First of all, with initial stimulus, studies that referenced, you know, being exposed to something sexual stimu sexually stimulated, just an initial, like what's happening in the brain immediately. Uh, we see the right hemisphere activates, the right side of the brain hem activates, which relates to our ability to process kind of the unknown, the nonlinear, the dynamic, or the chaotic. You know, it's like the art part of our brain or the, or the dramatic part of our brain. Um, <clears throat> as, as, as uh, you know, and, and we see the posterior insular cortex activate, which is actually underneath the cortex, that white matter under the cortex, uh, that limbic part of the brain, it actually activates, which is responsible for executive function, like coordinating other parts of the brain to do other things, but also decision making. And so it might be serving as like a, a stopgap of like, you know, this is a good decision to make good decisions. And there's actually some um, maybe intentionality behind, you know, uh, increasing our ability to make better decisions, maybe just for a little bit before it's gone. <laughs> uh, we see activation of the secondary somatosensory cortex, which is actually right underneath this blue line all the way across uh, that fold in the brain right there. It's responsible for, you know, uh, articulation of touch and textures, so like our ability to physiologically connect with the physical. And that seems to turn on and start to wake up through this process. We see also the hypothalamus and the thalamus activate right in here. And that part of the brain is responsible for like hunger, thirst, like maybe yearning perhaps. But we also see that it plays a role in increasing blood pressure and heart rate and things like that, more functional purposes as well. Um, and then we see on the right side, a deactivation of the right amygdala. And that is probably the alarm bells in our, our, our mind you know, kind of slowly calming down and becoming less vigilant to the world around us. Again, I want you to take a look at these slides on your own. There's more detail in there. We're not going to cover it. We don't have the time to go through them individually. Um, arousal stage. We see the left hemisphere deactivate. Um, Again, you can follow along as we go in these, these slides. I'd, I'd encourage that. We see the left side start to deactivate when there's physiological arousal, uh, less amplitude, less hyperperfusion. This is getting calmer. Um, we're kind of disconnecting with the logical and disconnecting with the structure and disconnecting with, you know, uh, maybe, you know, the rules or who knows what. They're kind of turning that part of our brain off. Um, there's also the genital area of the sensory motor strip, that blue line as it goes all the way across right here. There's different parts for different parts of the body, and we see them activate when there's sensation or, or, or you know, stimulation of that part. There's an evoked potential in this part of the brain. Uh, the genital area of the brain doesn't activate during arousal, even when it's being stimulated. So the brain is like routing that information in a different dynamic way in the brain. We call it a dimension. There's another dimension going on with the somatosensory cortex. We didn't actually know what it's doing yet, but we'll figure it out someday. Uh, we see the anterior cingulate activate. So this part of the brain right here, right underneath, you know, your uh, corpus callosum there in the front, that, that activates uh, and relates to emotional regulation and, uh, again, coordinating other structures, which I think during orgasm, we see that potentially being responsible for uh, some of the changes in orgasm. We see it kind of readying other parts of the brain, perhaps. And the ventral stratum, which is right there, uh, it has the nucleus incumbent in it. It's responsible for our sense of pleasure. That part of the brain starts to turn on and increase act its activation throughout the process through orgasm. All right, and again, Feel free to look through some of these slides. More detail in there. We just covered all of it, though. Uh, if you followed along, you were able to do that and, and see those references there. And orgasm stage. Two new things are occurring in orgasm. First, we see increased slow theta in the brain and increased activation of the right frontal cortex. 
um, and increased beta in the right frontal cortex. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about increased theta. There's not much known about it at all. It's associated with a deeper, detached meditation state. Uh, I might have something to do with, like, the, the, as the French would say, the petite mort, the little death, um, letting go, being disconnected from reality. It might have something to do with the left hemisphere being detached. You know, in our own labs, you know, we've done our own little, you know, curious, you know, experimentation on each other and found that increasing uh, slow wave behavior in the brain led to us being like a very content brick, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, days later having to go back and retrain the brain at a higher frequency so that, you know, for functional purposes, of like being a dad or a husband or a productive member of society, you just blank, you know, <laughs> um, but it might serve a purpose of, of, of kind of being detached from the world. And then the increased activation of the frontal cortex. Um, Heathman thought that, that the activity he saw in the frontal cortex was high amplitude and asymmetrical. He thought maybe it was seizures. And, and we learned later on that, no, it's probably not that at all. It's actually probably more about bonding, that there's this, all this, this, this discoordinated activation of the brain, the frontal lobe of the brain where the attachment and bonding, and it's probably for imprinting purposes that everything's gonna settle down and make new pathways with this new activation, it's gonna make new pathways. We wanna be intentional about that. We can use that to our advantage. Um, and it activates in both genders and it lingers for a little bit of time after orgasm. So let's talk about, you know, how we can use some of these, these things that we've learned in the brain. Impulse control, Whitman's 2007 work. Uh, upon initial stimulus, that's the best time to, you know, have a plan and execute it as far as, you know, what do you want to do? What kind of decisions do you want to have made? Uh, you know, you want to have those things made early on if you want them to be representative of, of you know, um, you know, uh, how you really, you know, most objectively <laughs> at this early stage. That's what we can tell from the brain. Uh, hyposexuality, if, if someone has hyposexuality and they, they want to relate differently to their sexuality, they want to have more enjoyable sexual experiences. <clears throat> we learned from Rodet, uh, Rodet, Rodet et al. 2000's work that, you know, we want to calm down the left side of our brain. Uh, women who struggle with hyposexuality, um, <clears throat> Uh, they were correlated with these neuro images of not being able to calm down the left side of the brain. So get rid of things that are on your mind, resolve big projects, phys physically clean the space and, and, and make less distracting stimulus and turn the lights down. Uh, and know that there's a mental barrier and accept that this is a sex organ that we have to, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, actually take into consideration as well. Okay. And, and, and there's some coaching that can be done there for our clients. Disability, very similar with the mental barriers, uh, except it's, it's important to know psychoeducationally that the vagus nerve can be adaptive and take over uh, the role of the spinal cord when the spinal cord is severed at kind of a low to mid-low level. Uh, it, can actually, it can actually take over uh, arousal and, 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 uh, and uh, orgasm as well. And it's very adaptive. Your brain's very committed to its sexuality. <clears throat> But we have to kind of accept that and know that and then kind of get some through some of those mental barriers in order for that to actually occur productively. Uh, bonding and attachment, we talked a little about this with the activation, it kind of settles down and can form new connection pathways. If we want to be intentional about using that, we should have increased eye contact, positive oriented communication after sex. Uh, you know, it's not the time to like storm out of there or leave or it's not the time to get into an argument that we could be intentional to have eye contact and intentional to talk positively and, uh, and, and use that bonding and attachment and let both of those you know, uh, frontal cortexes that are highly activated synchronize and, and, and form together with the mirror neurons. There's lots of good things there. Final considerations, we don't know the blind spots of neuroimaging. We found quite a few over the years, like with Heath's study in 1972. Uh, we've grown a lot, but we're most likely gonna find that we have more blind spots. Uh, we've mitigated some issues by comparing an individual's brain to an individual's brain and seeing how that's similar among different people, but there could still be blind spots with multiculturalism, age, gender, and the unknown. We don't know, so we're gonna be uh, open to future changes uh, and, uh, and continue to be humble in this industry. There's references for you to follow up on if you'd like. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, there's a lot more from these references that I did not even cover. Please ask me questions. I would love to answer them. Thank you very much.